Is this where we got to? Yes. Uh, is it possible to see the paragraph uh, just above, please? Yes, I think we did that one exactly. Yeah. We will uh, start off with uh, maybe a, a quick recap with that paragraph, and then we'll continue on if that's okay. Okay, perfect. Shall I pray to begin with? Yes, please. Oh Lord, Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening, thankful for life, thankful for the blessings, thankful for the blessed Sabbath that we've just passed here in the UK. We pray now that you be with us and bless us as we look at this uh, Adventist home, that everything may be done to your honour and glory, that we may glean from its from the writings of it ways where we can help ourselves to live a better life and also help others. So we ask that you'll be with us now. Pray for the presence of thy Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you very much, Antitocles. Good evening and welcome back to our study of the Adventist home. Um, we want to give a summary of what we were studying about last week. We are on chapter 20, I believe. Uh, the family and the city. And so last week, please do excuse the noise in the background. It's very, very windy. So a few things will be banging. Um, so it says here that um, sometimes as parents, we have made choices to stay in the city for no other reasons, but for worldly interests and love of gain. That is where we closed off last week. Um, and we looked at it and we had a couple of um, uh, families uh, that we were with and they gave a little bit of um, testimony of how they were trying to transition to the countryside. Now we know this council very well, um, especially during the COVID lockdown period. I think more people became more aware of the council to move to the countryside more than they did maybe previously because it wasn't always something that's maybe discussed in our local churches. So look at this council that was given more than 170 years ago. Where are we now? And with the pandemic um, that was, yeah, that we all faced, where are we now? So it's a question for everyone to ponder. But needless to say, there are many considerations um, to be taken into account when people are deciding to move to the countryside. The council is still the same. Uh, and as we're looking at the scriptures, God made it clear where he wanted his people to be. However, we are now told very clearly here that it took mainly because of worldly interest and love of gain. So we will open with this paragraph and then carry on to the next one. Uh, please do go back to previous studies where we went into detail. It says, it is often the case that parents are not careful to surround their children with right influences. In choosing a home, they think more of their worldly interests than of the moral and social atmosphere. And the children form associations that are unfavorable to the development of piety and the formation of right characters. Continues, parents who denounce the Canaanites for offering their children to Moloch, what are you doing? You are making a most costly offering to your mom and God, and then when your children grow up unloved and unlovely in character, when they show decided impiety and a decency, a tendency to infidelity, you blame the faith you profess because it was unable to save them. Mercy. You are reaping that which you have sown, the result of your selfish love of the world and neglect of the means of grace. You moved your families into places of temptation and the ark of God and the ark of God, your glory and defense, you did not consider essential and the Lord has not worked a miracle to deliver your children from temptation. 
So <clears throat> in summary, we are being told here that we have to reconsider our choices in where we decided to live. And if indeed we found ourselves in situations where we have chosen um, these places to live for no other reason except for worldly interests, then we are being told here that we are selling our children to Moloch and we are no different from the Canaanites. So God is now reminding us, if that is the case, especially if there are families who have young children or who are planning to have children should the Christ have not come yet, this is a high consideration. Where should our home be? Now, there are many considerations. Things have changed. Um, however, there is still opportunity as God opens doors and provision for each and every one of us at various times in our various situations. But we have to take him to God in prayer and allow him to lead. Antita, please, you have a hand. Yes, I, I, I've just you see some children, little toddlers. <coughs> the pair, both parents, go to work, and they're just they're just, and they put out, and they, they see the parents, uh, perhaps one hour in the morning, and then they come home at night, five or six o'clock. See the parents have the tea, then it's time for bed. You know how can you train a tra train a child when it's away from you all day? You know some parents are you know in circumstances where. They, you know, in order to keep the child, they've got to work. You know, uh, but it's a difficult situation, but you can understand why child, children grow up as they do, because they don't have the nurture of a nest. You know, I mean, animals and birds, they, 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 they're, they're kept with the young as long as they need to be. You know, the young are kept with the parents, but the children are not. Yeah, yeah. That is for sure. Now, um, I'll use myself as an example. Um, when I had my daughter, I wasn't aware of all this, what we're talking about here, all this wonderful counsel. And the question is, even if I was aware of it, was I ready to take that on um, at that time? Perhaps the seed would have been sown and maybe later on that seed would start um, to germinate. However, I give what, in reference to what you've just mentioned, uh, at Tuckley's, that was me, right? Because in my head at that time, I was more career focused because what else do you do? I didn't know. You go through the system of education and nobody's putting the system down here or there, but you go through that. And that's what I knew. You get a career. I didn't know about all this business about women's roles and positions and how the home ought to be and so on and so forth. So I followed the career path as everybody does. And so for me at that time, I was working in uh, Europe, right? So you can imagine sometimes I had to come traveling between England and Europe, England, Germany, England, Belgium, England, Netherlands, England, uh, uh, and so forth. So you can imagine some meetings. So, and sometimes I had to work far away from home. In other words, like I would have to take a train that was maybe three and a half hours away journey. Then after work, take that train back. That's six hours on the train. That's just a train. Now we're wondering what would have happened with my daughter then. Unfortunately, <laughs> from, um, from I think three or four months old, she was going in full-time childcare. So like I said, I didn't know. Um, and so in my head, in my understanding at that time, when you're working, you have a career. And so this is what you do. <laughs> Excuse me, you hand the child over. <clears throat> but that did not dawn on me at that point in time, because that is what was the natural process of things. And because I saw it happen with so many other people. So with my work at that point in time, I had four months maternity leave, one month before giving birth and three months after so hence why about three months, four months, she went into full-time nursery. Now listen to this, brethren. I was dropping her off seven o'clock in the morning. This is a three or four months child. I go to work. I come back. 
and I'm picking her up about six o'clock or six thirty in the evening and then getting home. Now, how much time do you think I could have with that child? I have not nursed her, changed her, bonded with her. I have not even the time to deal with her in the evening. Where am I living at this time? I'm living, of course, in the city and the demands of the cities. But I am a new mother. You can imagine the pressure, the, the up and down, right? And so I'm saying this to say that I am thanking God for what I know now. So wherever God finds you, wherever God finds your family, we have to take our individual circumstances to God and talk to the Lord to give us wisdom, understanding, and the conviction and motivation to move forward. So needless to say, that went on for, you know, um, about two or three, about two years, thereabouts, two and a half. Now, it didn't stop because I knew better. No, I went and continued into the next phase of, you know, uh, what I knew to be managing the child or child rearing and also managing my career. So it's you can see that even the early beginnings, I wasn't uh, participating in the child's life as I ought to. And needless to say, my health also uh, wasn't always um, maintained very well because of the pressures of working and the, the motherhood and so on and so forth. Nonetheless, at that point in time, I didn't have a clue that I'm actually putting my child in into or sacrificing my child to Moloch. The truth of the matter is I didn't even know God, right? Born in Adventism, didn't know what that meant, but just the normal, you know, because I went to church with my parents, but it was like going to school. So Saturday was another day to go like going to school. So I didn't understand the truths of the biblical text. And I certainly didn't have any idea of what is spiritual prophecy or whether it existed or not. But now that we have come to this understanding and this knowledge, at this point in time, God is saying to us, I need you now to reconsider where you're going to put the ark of God, where his glory can be, where he can place his defense, and where you understand that it is essential. Now, we all have different life situations. But if the situation is such that you can listen to the counsel and move forward, God is calling us to make the necessary moves. Thank you very much, Antissa, please. Anybody else before we move on? All right. So, <clears throat> cities offer no real benefits. Anybody like to read? Thank you, Antissa, please. Would anyone like to read this paragraph for us? Yes, I'll read it. Thank you. Cities offer no real benefit. There is not one family in a hundred who will be improved physically, mentally or spiritually by residing in the city. Faith, hope, love, happiness can far better be gained in retired places where there are fields and hills and trees. Take your children away from the sights and sounds of the city, away from the rattle and din of the streetcars and trams and their minds will become more healthier and it, it will be found easier to bring home to their hearts the truth of the word of god thank you uh just record i think we did do this paragraph last week mm -hmm. but uh definitely we can see the benefits um of moving to retired country places for some people they'll move from a city to a town a town to a village and then a bit more further out rural um, wherever the God has called you, the entire world belongs to the Lord. So for some, the Lord might not call them here in the UK. The Lord might call them elsewhere. Whatever the case is, all we have to ask God is to help us to heed. Is because if we go back to business as usual, and we've had a taster of what could come and the impending doom that is coming upon city, as God's people, then we have no real, um, uh, what's called, nothing to fall back on, so to speak, because we have been told. So it is a customized answer is what I always say. God will deal with every situation in a customized way. So my situation might be different from somebody else. But whatever it is, God sees all. 
But he's saying to us, the only benefits that we're going to get physically, mentally, and spiritually is going to be in retired places. And in that case, hopefully our faith, prayerfully our hope, love, and happiness will be um, increased, which is completely the opposite to what the cities have to offer. And the truth of the matter is, if we all observe our lives in the cities, wherever we are at this point in time, we are probably, a lot of us have gone through frustrations, have gone through um, health issues, the pressure, the, the, the traffic, the, the smog and smoke, the, uh, the, the hygiene or lack of in the city, the, uh, the lack of family time. We know all of this, you know? However, again, it is us to take it to the Lord one by one. This is my situation. There might be someone out there who is advanced in age. There might be someone out there whose children are already grown and left the home. There might be someone out there who's a single mother with young children or with older children. There might be someone who's a single father. There might be someone who's in a divorce situation and the children are residing with the mother. You know, so there are so many different scenarios, but again, God's answer is customized. It's not going to be easy. But God's answer is customized. So we can go on to the next one, which is where we're supposed to start today. Council on moving from the rural to city areas. What do we need to do? Let's see what council tells us. Auntie please. You want to move the paragraph up? All right. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Would anybody like to read this paragraph for us, please? Council on moving from the rural to city areas. Council for moving to from rural to city areas. Many parents remove from their country homes to the city regarding it as more desirable or profitable location. But by making this change, they expose their children to many and great temptations. The boys have no employment and they uh, obtain a street education and go on from one step into depravity to another until they lose all interest in anything that is good and pure and holy. How much better have the parents remained with, remained with their families in the country where the influences are most favourable for physical mental and mental strength? Let the youth be taught to labour in tilling the soil and let them sleep the sweet sleep of weariness and innocence. Thank you very much. Mm. So a question. Has anybody seen this trend? I think I made an error before. It was more not moving to the city to rural areas, but rather moving rural, from rural to city areas. Has anyone seen this trend? Okay, well, um, I have to say I have seen it um, and also I've heard much being said about it. For example, um, I think we mentioned it also last week, there at the point we're living now, there is a lot of families, not necessarily just people of God, but there are a lot of families who've moved outside of the rural areas and moved into cities. Why? In search of work, because apparently there's less work available in the rural areas. And also for us who want to move into the city, one of our questions that we ask is, what will I do when I get to the rural area? What will I do for work to earn a living? Because life is such that we almost have to pay for everything. But in this one, what he's saying is that there is a trend, and I think some of us have seen it over the last few decades, where people are moving out, especially young families or young people moving out of the rural areas into the city, so much so, that there's even an epidemic, so to speak, in certain countries. And here in the UK, you have the older generation in the rural areas. The younger people are out into the cities. So now you have a situation there where the older people are getting older and it could end up that nobody is looking after the land or farming or whatever the activities are in that area. But as God's people, God is telling us, this is a mistake. 
if you were in a rural area in the first place and you move to the city, it's an error. Reconsider what were the real purposes of moving out there and what have you really left behind? Because the previous paragraph told us that to gain strength physically, spiritually and mentally, the retired areas are best. Any comments so far? Or what have you noticed? Have you come across such a thing? Anyone to share with us? All right. Apparently, in a country like Spain, um, there is, uh, I forget what they call it, but I believe there is what they're calling a, a not a blank hole. Um, I forgot what the term is. But apparently, there's a huge, huge um, circle within um, Spain where the outer parts of Spain are overpopulated. It has the city areas. But within the center of Spain, there's a huge gap. In other words, the homes are abandoned or there isn't enough people there because there was a time when most people moved out uh, of the rural areas and went into the cities. And I'm sure for some African countries also, that might be the case that young people are leaving the rural areas and going into the city in search of whatever it is that they're searching for. Does that mean that now there's more places in the rural areas for God's people to move out into the rural areas? I don't know. But what it is saying here is that it is an error anyway, but we have a responsibility if we can to stay in the rural areas or move to the rural areas and try to teach the young people the ABC of true education, and that is in tilling the soil or learning in nature. And of course, then health-wise, spiritually, physically, and mentally, there should be hopefully an improvement. Okay. Any comments so far? Anyone wishes to share something here? Okay, if there isn't anyone at the moment, we can continue uh, uh, just a bit. We can move up a bit. Yes. All right, would you like to read the next paragraph? Through neglect of parents, the youth in our cities are corrupting their ways. And pulling their soul, pu polluting their soul before God. This will ever be the fruit of idleness and Alzheimer's. Al <laughs> the pr the almshouses. Al almshouses. The prisons and the gallows publish the sorrowful tale of the neglected duties of parents. That's sad. A lot, mm. a lot of um, youth are in prison because they've been dragged up. Mm. They don't know. No, they've not had a proper home life, gone out in the street, yeah. street gangs. Yeah, and, and uh, um, the parents aren't been there for them. They've been working, getting money, and the parents just haven't been there for them. And the warning, yeah, for children to have a proper bring it up, it damages the mind. And the prior paragraph mentioned particularly boys. Mm. Mm. Um, that they seem to be, and I think we've seen it. Uh, we only have to look enough at the news or in our local areas because not all stories make the news. Um, like she said, we would know where to find them if we don't find them on the streets, the prisons or the gallows uh, in, this, uh, in this case, or games, uh, arenas, or whatever the case is, then we're going to find them in one of these places, but where we should find them is home or in gainful employment that is actually um, conducive to the development of their physicality, sp uh, spiritual, spirituality, and also uh, mental state. So focus is a lot here on our boys. 
which means that, or at least I can deduce from here that, yes, we is calling for the, the involvement of the parents, but what is key also here, which is probably not say, is that the father is called to take up a certain role and responsibility to guide these young men. Um, I will continue, Antitakis, please share your point, and then I'll continue after that. Yes, you find that the boys, many of men are in prison and the girls end up starting families when the children themselves. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I'm not saying that this is always the case, but it is certainly one of the main um, concerns that we will have with our boys. In which of these places would they end up? And some of them, even they lose their life at an early stage when they had such a future ahead of them. Future disciples, shall we say, future workers for the Lord, um, but losing their lives and end up in the grave far too early. Uh, for the girls, of course, uh, um, the, the, yeah, the main concern maybe of a parent is um, the child coming back, you know, pregnant uh, at an early stage, unready, or um, caught up in, you know, drugs and, and so on and so forth. So we have a lot of work to do. Now, is the parent to be blamed for all of these choices? Is this statement ringing true? Is it true to a great extent or not? And is it always because of the neglect of the parent? Have we gone so far? What are your thoughts? Now we have, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but here in um, in the new world or in uh, Europe or maybe the new way of living, um, we have this thing where the government almost is dictating to us at what point our child becomes an adult, right? We're given the age 18, okay? And it almost seems as if from the time that the child is 18, they are free to um, do whatever they want or make certain choices as they wish without the intervention or input of the parent if they don't want it. Now, I don't know about, I don't know particularly about, uh, about that or how true it rings for some families. Um, and I know that in this modern age, things uh, have changed, but if I recall when I was, you know, growing up with my parents, 18 has nothing to do with it. A parent is a parent. Therefore, a parent is someone who is a, a pivotal figure in your life. When there is necessity for counsel, for making certain decisions, for, uh, for guidance, uh, and so forth. But it almost seems like we're in an environment where a parent is almost abnormal that a child of a certain age should come to a parent and have a close relationship with the parent you know that it's like we're teaching them to be independent of parents perhaps i have not um i hope i have explained myself properly so what does that say for us as people of god are we also going according to to this uh, do we are we neglectful of our duties um i know we have the legal system but we're now talking about a biblical text, the word of God. Are we missing something? Are we failing somewhere? I don't know if I'm making my question clear. Anybody? I suppose what I'm trying to say is that, is there a time when a parent's job is now done because the child has reached a certain age? I don't think so in any way. Uh... They end up being parents to the grandkids these days, don't they? You find a lot of a lot of um, grandparents don't have a life of their own because they're just babysitters. You know, they 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 just they just have to live around the grandchildren.
so are you saying, Auntie, that then we, some of um, us parents, we've left the bringing up of the children to the grandparents, the young children, if I uh, understand? The, 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 the children need the parents to look after their children. You find the grandparents, they, they, they can't, um, they can't, um, hang on a minute, let me just um, shut the door a minute. Okay, while well, we wait for... Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just like to shut the door because I could hear uh, talking into the room. Um, yes, um, you find that the, the, the parent, the grand, the parent, the grandchildren, yeah, the, the, grand, the parents now are having to look after the grandchildren so they don't have a life of their own. We see you now loads of child, loads of parents, they're just looking after the grandchildren. The, 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 the parents of the grandchildren, their kids are out at work and they're looking after the grandchildren, they haven't got a life of their own. Oh, I see. I see yeah. what you mean. So because um, the parents, so they're still doing the role of parents, even though it's the grandchildren, because the, you know, it's a, it's money it drives it all. Because you know you can't live on one wage. It's very very difficult. But um, hmm. you know this is what's happening. This is what's happening. We know loads of people at church think they're going to retire and have a nice, you know, nice take it easy than the grandchildren. They, they don't get any time for themselves. And that's how it is. Uh, oh, I see. I see what you're saying. So the grandparents are basically taking the mothering uh, parenting role rather than their children who actually gave birth to the cho uh, to the children because yeah, they have to say, yeah. Okay. So there's an extra um, heaviness for some grandparents to take on that role just so that their children can make ends meet, so to speak. Okay. Um, and so that the parents can put their children with a familiar family member, I suppose, rather than put them out to pay for childcare with an unfamiliar um, a person. So I, yeah, it's it's that's a definitely a real scenario that happens a lot. But I suppose my question here was more like, okay, here it says that uh, through the neglect of parents, the youth in our cities are corrupting their ways and polluting their souls before God. Um, and so when we're talking about youth, what are we, what age groups are we talking about here? Is there a time when we have to, when we can um, relinquish some of those responsibilities because our children are now grown um, in the UK? Um, that age is almost between 16 and 18, so to speak. But when we're talking about it from the context of the biblical text, is there a time where a child is no longer under the headship of a parent or a father in the home. Uh, there is a hand. Brother JB, please. I think I'll say when they're old enough to be arrested, because if a little child steals something, um, they really can't be thrown in jail, but they can be told off. But when they're deemed to have a capacity then the adults, when they can be arrested and brought before the court, they are an adult and the, the parents are no longer responsible for their actions. They are responsible for their own actions. They can stand in judgment at that time. Ah, thank you very much, Brother JV. So is that to say then, if I understand that at that point in time, the consequences of that child's um, actions might be partly to do with or wholly to do with the neglect of parents, or is it more to do with that that child is now of age, is now responsible and has made certain choices despite, because not every parent is neglectful, but yet the children sometimes turn around and do the opposite. So is this um, responsibility only up to a certain age? And if I understand you correctly, Brother JB, is that when the child gets to an age where they now can be held as an adult to stand in judgment, then the responsibility is now falling on the child? Thank you very much, Brother JB. Any other points? So is it wholly um, the responsibility of parents to serve or to, to be blamed for the actions of the youth afterwards? And is it solely because of the city environment that the children have been brought up in? 
I mean, the, I don't know if I'm making the, um, the question clear. Brother JB, please, you have your hand. But are we saying then the cities are corrupting every every youth? Very good question. I don't think the cities can corrupt every youth. I think the parents are responsible to train up the child in the way of the Lord, in the way they should go. Once the parent does that, after that, they are not responsible because they can be taught properly, Cain and Abel. They were taught the same thing. Mm -hmm. But if one of one of them chooses to rebel, they then the the, the blame can't be visited on the parents. The blame is visited on, on the one that committed, I mean, the murder. Why? That's why God did not visit the parents. He visited the very one that committed the murder because he was taught everything. He knew everything very well. But if he wasn't taught, then maybe God was going to visit the blame on the parents. So... As long as the parents have done what they're supposed to do, the child can grow up and decide to be whatever they want to be. God will hold them responsible, but the parents have to do their duty. But my question is, is, is every youth being corrupted by the ways of the city? Thank you very much, Brother JB, for those points. Thank you very much. There is a question from Mother JB. Is every youth corrupted by living in the city? Please do share with us so we can have an interactive discussion. And it's okay. I do find that... Um... Like the three children, two will grow up really well, and the third one will be the the, the the um you know the the bad one of the family. Sometimes end in prison. As as Cain and Abel were both different. They both have the same environment, both have the same parents, but one uh, well one killed the other, didn't they? Um, we we know, we know it's not it's not you're better off in the country. Everybody's better off in the country. We know that but the environment, but. It depends what their the relationship with Christ is. You know, if they're not haven't got a relationship with Christ, then they're open to all the vice there is. But if they've got a relationship with Christ, then there's hope. So our job then, uh, like Brother JB is uh, um, saying, and also the Antitocles, as parents, is to bring the children up in the way of the Lord. If we have done our job, then by God's grace and through much prayer, we hope that the children will make the right choices. Um, it says here, especially to for those with younger children or planning to have uh, a children, better sacrifice any and every worldly consideration, though not every child that is brought up in the city will certainly go into this direction, um, but we are still told that better sacrifice any and every worldly consideration than to imperil the precious souls committed to your care. They will be assailed by temptations and should be taught to meet them. But it is your duty to cut off every influence, to break up every habit, to sunder every tie that keeps you from the most free, open, and hearty committal of yourselves and your family to God. The council still remains, if I'm reading this correctly, that best places are in the retired country places. There is a better opportunity, maybe to the saving of our children. Is it still the same case today? In this modern uh, world that we're living in with the technologies and everything that is uh, you know, uh, available to our children? Perhaps. The counsel is still the same. If we are able to, and God opens a way, especially with the young children, we are told here that they will face temptations. But our job is to teach them to be able to meet those temptations. 
so that they're not assailed by them, but they can overcome and walk away from them. And the truth of the matter is, even us as grown folk, being in the cities, there are many temptations that we struggle with. So if we, who are saying we have relationships with God, are struggling to sometimes overcome some temptation, what about these young youth impressionable minds? But what Brother JB is sharing there is that if we have done our best and we have sacrificed whatever is necessary as God leads us, at the time God leads us, whatever, wherever he finds us, he will be committed also to do the best to the saving of our children. Any other points to share? At this point in time, what are some of the things that we would have to sacrifice in today's age? Well, this is 170 years ago. Times have moved on. Things have changed. What are some of the things that we need to consider, depending on who you are and where you are in life, to sacrifice? And what are the every worldly consideration? Apart from the, the money aspect, what are some of the sacrifices we'll need to make? Or what are some of the sacrifices you've seen families make? Um, and almost the word sacrifice kind of gives it a little bit of a negative connotation. Um, uh, but it's not all um, painful and bad news. So what are some of the things that we might have to give up in order to not imperil our children? Anyone, any thoughts? All right, if there are no thoughts on that question, then we will uh, move on. Antitoclis, would you be able to read the next paragraph instead of the crowded city? Instead of the crowded city, seek some retired situation where your children will be so far as possible shielded from temptation and there train and educate them for usefulness. The prophet Ezekiel thus enumerates the cause that led to Sodom's sin and destruction. Pride, fullness of bread and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. All who would escape the, so the doom of Sodom must shun the cause that brought God's judgment upon that wicked city. Mm -hmm. Please carry on. When Lot entered Sodom, he fully intended to keep himself free from iniquity and to command his household after him, but he sig singly failed. The, the, corruption, the corrupting influences about him had an effect upon his own faith and his children's connection with the inhabitants of Sodom bound up his interests in a measure with theirs. The rest is before us. Many are still making similar mistakes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And then let it be your study. What is the answer? Let it be your study. Now we've had these examples about God's judgment, um, Sodom and Gomorrah being visited, um, and the situation with Lot. We know it very well. But then what are we counseled to do? What should we do? Let it be. Let it be your study to select and make your homes as far from Sodom and Gomorrah as you can. Keep out, the large, keep, out, keep out of the large cities. If possible, make your homes in the quiet retirement of the country, even if you can't, can never become wealthy by so doing. Locate where it is best, the best influence. Home. 
even if you can never become wealthy by doing so. Right? And the instruction by the laws. I'm instructed by the Lord to warn our people not to flock to the cities to find homes for their families. To father and mother, I'm instructed to say, fail not to keep your children within your premises. Fail not to keep your children within your premises. The fact of the matter, we've heard it being told many times by our very own um, uh, elders, our very own uh, teachers, throughout this entire prayer retreat ministries platform. Since 2020, we have been hearing messages of uh, doom that are coming, messages of repentance, messages of um, the situation, the impending situations to come. Uh, we've been told many of the current events that are taking place um, within our cities, our countries, and globally. We cannot, if we have been uh, awake during this period, this almost four-year period, say that we have not heard or have not had the opportunity to hear some of this, um, uh, yeah, some of this uh, um, teachings that have been taught on various subjects, whether it's health reform, whether it's country living, whether it's true education, um, you know, whether it's uh, evangelism, we know it, we know it. So if there is someone out there who has not yet started making preparation, then I can only implore you, as is the council here, wherever you can, please seek God in prayer and let him convict your heart, whatever situation you are in, particularly those who have young children. Now, there are those also who might have older children, and perhaps the older children do not want to hear of it, do not want to move with the parents. And they have become of an age where they can make their own decisions. Okay, all we can do is keep praying for them, but their hearts will also be touched and convicted at some time before it's too late. But we all are fully aware that there is likely to be another lockdown, another pandemic, etc. Uh, more enforcements, 15-minute cities, all that sort of things that are in the back burner there, but we've seen enough examples to know what's coming. And the Lord has not left us blind. He has given us much counsel in the scriptures and spiritual prophecy that this is coming. So the instruction is a warning to the people. Do not flock to the cities. And if we are already there, then may God guide us and give us provision and providence to move out. But it will start with the conviction of the heart. So whatever you are doing, if your intention is to move, then may the Lord help you and hasten in your preparation. Okay? So that our children, and oftentimes our children fail to have a, a connection. Now maybe I'm speaking of myself and my experience. Uh, a connection with God and relationship with God because they don't see it with the parents. Us walking in faith, exemplifying faith, exemplifying our relationship with God. And so sometimes we fail them through that without necessarily seeing it. But by God's grace, there is opportunity to reconsider, come before the Lord in repentance to the saving of our children. Um, uh, if there are any points, I would like to take some more uh, points at this moment uh, because it's um, it's time to share. We might not get these opportunities again. So does anyone have any points to share? And I have to say for me personally, I'm very thankful for this platform because throughout these last few years, it has been a wealth of knowledge and teaching. Yeah. And some of the decisions that I have made were due to also understanding and learning through the very teachers that have come on this platform. So I hope it's been the same for you. Adita, please. You have taken us to? Yes, I was just going to um, say that um, um, when Lot entered Sodom, he fully intended to keep himself free from iniquity and to command mm -hmm. his household after him. But we could see what happened 
what happened with the, um, his daughters. Yeah, do you, you know? And obviously, that's what was going off in Sodom as well. There's all kinds of incest. incest and everything, and so you know the daughters didn't think it was wrong. Obviously, they got him drunk, didn't they? Mm. What were they doing with, with beer in the house or whatever it was? What did they Wine. get? Wine, probably grape juice, fermented. You well, know, I don't they'd they learned all that, that in Sodom, so it, 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 they brought Sodom out with them. Yeah, must have brewed it themselves. Mm. It was a most horrid story um, yeah. to learn about the Lord's uh, unimaginable, though I know that these things do happen in uh, in reality, uh, the case of incest and so forth. But it was a most horrid, you know, because when we go back to the journey of Lot and Abraham, from when they got the command to move, and Lot came along with Abraham, it was something else no one could have considered the end result you know but we see some of the effects of what happened to those children and not to forget lot's wife you know and we we have all these examples and basically you know it's not fear mongering it's just that god is just trying to draw us back onto himself and on to where we you know where we will be able to hear his voice more appropriate and more clearly but when we are now uh, in conflict or combating our godly thoughts with what we are seeing in front of us and the various temptations it becomes difficult um to hear god's voice and it's okay yeah uh lot wasn't a very good example to his daughters because when all the man the wicked men come round the door he offered them to him do what you like to him but he wouldn't have his visitors, you know. How how many fathers would do that? That was a horrible thing to do. You know, it was, that, was, men, that it, was sin, that was. He knew the men wouldn't touch him, but that No, was, but he wouldn't know that. Right. He wouldn't know that. He wouldn't be, he couldn't be 100% sure that, that would, that the men wouldn't touch the daughters. It was a disgusting thing to do. Now that is definitely an interesting um, um, story of what, whether Lot knew or didn't know, but also looking at the condition of how these men were, you know, banging on those doors. Uh, <laughs> one can only imagine what the intentions, you know, intentions were and the, what they could have done uh, to the daughters if they were going to go for the daughters. But the, the fact still remains that it was a horrid, situ a horrid situation that they were in. And it was um, it was inconceivable in, in our minds. It, it was too much. But what the Bible is telling us there, that it's because of where Lot placed his family, the influences. He wasn't quite in the city. He wasn't quite. But somehow, over time, it's almost like we find him now in the city, you know, no longer on the outside, but in, even at the gate, I believe the Bible says. So the more we play, the more closer we are to this temptation, it will have an impact sooner or later, whether buried in the child's mind in terms of thought processing or whether it actually is acted out. God is still telling us the same thing. And it's okay. Yes, I think he had two, he had um, two children that were married in the city from what I can remember. So there was two, there was, uh, three uh, dead casualties of the city, then there was two living casualties of the city, the two living daughters. Um, and the, the mother and the, the kid, children died, you know, and then there was him himself. So they, they all, um, it was a bad, it was a bad place to go. It, it's, it, it ruined his family. But also remember the influence that was also on him because when the angels were taking him out of the city, he started negotiating. <laughs> you remember that? So, you know, I still... Another city, just a little one. Just a little one over there. And so we know all this. And again, the admonition is, let us reconsider. And honestly speaking, this is a good big God that we serve. If we are convicted and our conviction is in line with his desire and his will, he cannot fail but uphold his name and open ways that he wants to open for us to move, where he wants us to move. The entire world is his footstool.
So it doesn't have to be limited to the UK. For some, it will be the UK, for others, it will not. You know, but wherever the Lord is leading you or I, we have to follow suit. Um, I think because of our time, what time do we have until then, Sophie? We started a little bit late. Um, let's see how many paragraphs we have left. A little bit further. Okay, yeah. We've got about three left, haven't we? We have about three left. Well, so three sections, say. Yeah. Yeah. About three. Where, where do we get to? Yeah, it's, this is where. Um... So that. We... I think we're not going to read the next section. Please go ahead, Esther, please. Well, it, this is. It, did we read this bit? Yeah. We've done that one. Oh yeah, yeah, yes, this is where we start then. This is the next one. Um, yes, we'll start there for next week. We are going to open the floor. Are there any questions, any points? It's rather very quiet this evening, but I'm sure there is much that someone can share with us. Um, so if you do have something to share, please, we have a few more minutes. Open your mic and share with us. We're all here to learn. One thing that is um, um, a challenge is to undo uh, a learning um, to, especially in the our own minds, of course, because we're grown, but there's a lot of unlearning that we have to do, but let alone our children. So um, if we can, by God's grace, continue and try our best to teach them what is right, Hopefully, by God's grace, they will be able to decipher what is wrong. But if they're constantly surrounded by what is wrong, it's very difficult to decipher what is right. Um, and for those that are trying, aiming, or whatever challenging situation, we let us continue to pray for each other because it's not, it's not easy. It's not impossible, but it's certainly not going to always be smooth sailing. I see a hand. And it's okay. People follow what is in fashion, clothes, um, places to go, lifestyle. It's what's in fashion. What's the fashion of the year, and that's and that's how it is. You know, you notice people, uh, especially youngsters, they'll dress alike. They've all got the hair the same. Um, you know, they might just have slight different clothes, but they're all they're all the same. People follow fashion, and whatever's fashionable in the city, that's what goes. You have to be, you have to be, we have to be a peculiar people and stand out against it. That's what we're told, to be a peculiar people. Um, the truth doesn't change, your lifestyle shouldn't change, you should, you should live up to God's word. Very true, the worldly interests, uh, but a lot of times also um, our, our children, by God's grace, will follow our example or will observe us because it is no it is no good us going in and out of church sabbath after sabbath morning evening devotion uh, and so on and so forth but when it now comes to the acting out that faith then we hold back our children will question us Sometimes they might even dare call us hypocrites to our faces. So by God's grace, you know, we can make uh, changes and turnarounds. And it is a prayer point. But we also have to know the difference between delay and waiting uh, when God has spoken. Uh, so at least that is my prayer. Lord, help me understand the difference between delay and waiting. Because delay is now lingering, but you've given an express command. Or maybe you've opened an opportunity, but I didn't take it. I need to understand the difference. So that will be dependent 
for me knowing how God talks to me. And it is the same for you. And it's okay. And the other thing, what I was thinking as well, you find some families, they have children, they're happily married, the children get happily married, and the grandchildren get happily married. You find other families, divorce and all kinds of things going on. It seems to, they seem to be a trend in families. So these things seem to run in families. Um, you know, it's, yeah, I've seen no end of it. You know, mm. with, with the family this, this week, and um, happily married, the, all the two daughters are married, and the other daughter's caught in, you know. And, you know, everything's going nice for them. The other families, it's just turmoil. You know, it happens to families. If, if you live in a family where, the, where it's like volcanic, you're more likely to make a bad marriage. Mm. Sometimes they get married to get out of the house, and then they found they've ran, married the wrong one. Yeah. That's because sometimes we are a product of our, not only our nurturing, but also our environment. And I think this is what um, we are learning here, that environment has a great deal to do or has a huge impact on how we respond within the world to the world and how who we become um, and our choices. So yes, there is indeed a trend in quite a lot of cases that when someone comes out of brokenness, they're more likely to attract similar brokenness. Um, and when they're coming out of a wholesome environment, they're more likely to seek out a similar wholesome environment. You know, however, um, with all that being said, and that is indeed uh, the case in a lot of um, cases, God is wonderful because he rewrites, he can rewrite histories and uh, messy pasts and, um, you know, and I very much like when it says in the, um, in the commandments um, that his mercy, uh, I, I'm just uh, quoting uh, differently now, but wickedness he will visit to the third and fourth generation but to those that turn around to him that can be cut short in fact there is no time limit in how far his mercy can extend so that tells me that though some of us most of us are coming from brokenness god can rewrite our futures if if we give ourselves back to him through repentance, prayer, and seeking his power. So sometimes, yes, just because we come from brokenness and our environment have not always been, you know, what we wanted them to be. Our parents might not have always known um, what they ought to have done. But God's mercy is still extended because there is a generation that can turn back to God. So that is our hope despite the messiness we come from. Any other points? Otherwise, we're going to close here. I'm going to assume the brethren are silent because they're in much thought uh, or preparing at least um, for next week when we come back together again. So, Auntie Tuckley, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much for those who took part and those who are listening in the background. Thank you, Sister V, for taking the, the meeting. We were blessed, and thank everyone that's joined. At uh, 4.45, it will be morning prayers. And at 5, 6, six o'clock, Desire of Ages. Desire of Ages. 12 o'clock, um, uh, midday prayer. Midday prayer, and the speaker is Evangelist Wycliffe. He's done a week before for us before and now he's, he does the Sundays for us sometimes. So and his his um topic is it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. It's called let me just get the poster. Um, it's from Uganda. Yeah, um let me just get the poster. I just wanna make sure it's right. I can't find it now. Dump dogs. Dump dogs. So I, uh, I'm not sure what he's going to preach about, but the message is dump dogs. And then at um, 6.30, it will be song service. Hopefully people will join us to see. Yeah. 7 o'clock, the, the preacher for the week is Pastor Anthony Jackson from, from the 
the United States. He lived in Las Vegas and uh, he'll be the preacher for the week. He's no stranger to um, prayer retreat. And don't forget um, to um, book up for the, the forthcoming camp meeting from the 20th to the 26th of December. Yes, all uh, roads lead to Kevin Lee. That's right, we've got uh, two good speakers, Elder Kudzai Kagura, he's the founder of, one of the founders of Prayer Retreat, and also um, evangelist Chris Hudson. He's well known, he's a, he's a, he's a world well known preacher and uh, preach present truth. And he'll be, the, he'll be the speaker as well. And then there's other speakers and a lot going on. So see what you can do to make it possible for yourselves to come. Have a nice evening, everyone, and see you all later by God's grace. Mm -hmm.